All right, welcome back everyone. We're in our last panel of the day. Um, we're, uh, it's the longest panel of the day, the last panel of the day, so I hope that we can maintain the energy. We have four great papers to hear from. And we'll have 15 minutes, five minutes for discussion, and then we'll go into the next paper and then keep 15 minutes at the end for open discussion. Okay, well, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for having us. On behalf of my co-author and myself, uh, we're going to talk today about the story in the data, entrepreneurship, and creative economy reports. And we know that the creative economy is really touted as an engine for economic prosperity and social good in urban areas. It's really a combination of the cultural cities, cultural industries, city branding, cultural tourism, and the creative class. And we know the field has really gained a lot of attention as a tool for municipal policymakers when they want to foster city building. So many in, within these cities, many cities and consulting entities have produced studies and reports on the promise of the creative economy. However, there exist few analyses of these reports and their inherent policy value. So this article explores five creative economy reports from cities on three continents and uses the narrative policy framework through an iterative coding framework. And we believe that this emergent policy framework is really going to be useful to look at the setting, the characters, the plot, and the outcomes or moral of the story to analyze the framing of policy in a new and different way. And we know that one of, uh, that we know that cities are entrepreneurial themselves in their collective effort to compete for development resources, such as attracting jobs and people. And one often cited aspect of the creative economy is its reliance on entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial action. So it's a city acting as an entrepreneur, as a tool for innovation and economic development. And as I said, cities are entrepreneurial in their efforts to compete for things like resources, jobs, and attracting residents and tourists. And the project of the city puts the city itself in competition on local, national, and global scales and encourages entrepreneurial action, which would mean identifying and capitalizing an opportunity, capturing an audience, and building on a recognizable brand identity. So these creative city reports are commissioned to operationalize local creative economies, to measure creative economic outputs, to create a picture of a labor force, and to contextualize the value of creativity. So we ask, how do creative economy reports construct an image of the city as an entrepreneurial actor in its orientation towards measuring, contextualizing, and deploying the arts and creative industries as an engine for economic development? We believe that there have not been sufficient efforts to analyze the policy value of these creative city reports. And we seek to fill this gap by analyzing the way that these reports use evidence to make claims and recommendations. Now we know that cities, scholars are, have shown that cities are fundamentally engaged in innovation and opportunity recognition, that policy boosters seek to market their city as a solution to urban challenges and when a policy booster or a city itself positions itself as a creative city, it can foster the image that these policy boosters are hoping to attain. But why would cities tout the creative economy? Within the creative industries, there is fundamental engagement in innovation, pursuing untapped markets, developing product innovations, recognizing and seizing opportunity, or the pursuit of change which could lead to fostering creative mindsets and seeking to attract residents, workers, and corporations to specific cities. So this creative economy rationale incorporates economic growth as a goal for cities, putting forward the tool of arts and culture, as well as innovation, as a solution to the challenges that I had named before about attracting residents, tourists, businesses, and which could result in a stronger tax base. So we know though that exogenous and endogenous shocks often are sparks that motivate the creation of these kinds of analytical reports and studies. And these reports encourage policymakers to compete on the international stage as a creative force. And the use of the city as a rhetorical tool mobilized 
through empirical facts in these reports is really important. So things like financial challenges, changes in neighborhood composition, and the exodus of creatives from a city due to escalating urban costs of living, rising density, and the dearth of affordable creative spaces are factors that lead to the call for analysis of you know, the creative sector and the role that it plays. Some cities might produce these profiles to inspire the acceptance of this arena as an economic engine. So they want to use data a lot of times to do this. And centering the city as the boundary that surrounds the creative economy is a rhetorical tool that cities cultivate and deploy towards strategic entrepreneurial ends as they compete for these kinds of resources, both globally and locally. So what we did is we, cho we chose five of these kinds of reports, one from Austin, one from Chicago, one from Adelaide, Australia, one from New York City, and one from London. And we use the narrative policy framework, which is an analytical framework that looks at the subjective and non-rational elements of public policy. And we created an inductive coding scheme that was based on identifying the story and the data as used as evidence in these creative economy reports. And we use this as an analytical lens to look at the keystones with which we can understand public policy. And what we do is we seek to identify and compare some of the subjective aspects of these creative economy reports through this coding process, an inductive coding process that was based around capturing the narrative rhetorical structures in these reports. We as researchers came to a consensus on how narrative devices and empirical evidence, the story and the data, are used to link claims in these creative industry policy documents. Now, within these reports, we use the narrative policy framework to code for aspects of the story and the data. In operationalizing the story, we look for the narrative elements that tell the story of the creative economy. We hope to identify how these contextual and city-specific narrative devices are deployed in these reports towards establishing a link between entrepreneurship, artists, and creative industries, and economic development within the particular municipal context. So here we look at the settings, the character, hero and villain, the plot, the outcomes or moral of the story, and policy recommendations. And this is a framework that's been used to analyze other kinds of policy. So in the data, we look at the proportion of report pages in the data appendix, the count of tables and figures, the number of interview quotes, the references to other cities, and also references to other creative economy reports. Now, each of the five creative economy reports makes claims and arguments about the assets and needs of the city. So this is about the setting that support their claims with narrative form or, and or with data about their city. The setting that we identify is apparent within the first five pages of each report. Now, two themes emerge from this research. One, the promise of the creative economy as utilized by Austin, New York, and London and measuring the creative economy utilized by Chicago and Adelaide. As you can see from this coded section of the Austin report, that the promise of the creative economy is laid out in economic and labor impact to the municipality. Now here we see the heroes and the villains. So we have each city and we identify the hero in the city and we identify the villain as the report has stated. Now four of the five reports identify the same hero, the creative workforce. But despite their shared asset, the cities report different villains. Rhetorically, these villains show us the problem that the cities will seek to attack using policy recommendations in the report. The comparison of similar heroes and disparate villains within these reports shows the strength of this policy framework for analyzing policy documents and shows how different problems are approached different given the particular settings and heroes that inhabit a city. So we can see that different kinds of villains that each of the cities named. 
Now, what about the plot? Put simply, in this research, the plot is meant to identify what happened in the report. Each report focused on the city's potential for developing or maintaining the creative economy. Thematically, each report was identified as reflecting the themes of entrepreneurship and economic development. Now, these themes emerged in narrative text describing entrepreneurial action in the city's creative sector or through providing measurement strategies for collecting data on the entrepreneurial workers in the creative sector. The plots for each of the reports varied and focused on creative sector growth in Austin, comparison to peer cities in Adelaide and Chicago, turning inward and mapping its own assets, that's London, and agglomeration and collaboration in New York. The plot of the reports is the key narrative structure for linking the setting and the characters towards making the case that will ultimately be addressed and the outcomes or the moral of the story. The moral of the story or the outcome is the narrative device that puts out the call for action. And now in our study, the moral of the story should clearly establish the link between entrepreneurial action, artists and the creative economy to bolster municipal economic development. This section of a creative city report might also outline specific policy recommendations meant to use the city's particular setting and hero to address the issues posed by the villain, thereby addressing the moral of the story. So we see in Adelaide, uh, they had to foster a creative city, but that city was more isolated. So they needed to understand that they had to attract creatives. Now, just as the reports use narrative elements as evidence to support the recommendations, they rely on other kinds of data to support their claims, the story and the data. Three of the five reports have data appendix sections. And of these reports, the proportion of the report that is made up of the data section varies widely. The appendices are primarily made up of additional figures and tables, though each report uses tabled numerical data and figures to represent their findings as you can see in this chart. Three of the five reports also re rely on heavy use of citations from other creative city reports, policy literature, and academic literature to support their claims. Though, though not presented as evidence within the framework of the story or the data, we also coded information about each report's authors because we thought that was also important. And so you can see that some consulting firms, some academics and some municipal uh, organizations and some think tanks were the ones that uh, did this research. Now I want to talk to conclude about policy outcomes. So we believe that these reports encourage uh, cities to understand how they can use the creative economy, these kinds of reports to make policy recommendations. And the report structure and use of evidence can strategically guide towards the, the moral of the story towards policy aims. Now this study is not meant to empirically generalize to all cities or all creative city reports and it's not a comparative case study. But we believe that this policy framework can help to understand how to use these kinds of research reports in terms of both the moral of the story and dealing with any challenges that each of these cities might face. And we believe that future research should examine how cities can use creative economy reports and related documents to frame the social good and so-called dark side of the creative economy and associated economic development in cities. But unless the focus on creative city options also includes the public good side of this conversation, there is a danger that any interventions may be tied to the private sector with exogenous economic shocks as a threat to sustainability, which we're seeing now. So we believe that our key contribution in the case of entrepreneurship in the creative economy is providing an empirical example of how narrative policy framework can be used as a tool for municipal policymakers to link data, core concepts, and narrative towards policy recommendations. And we believe that this study illuminates one strategy for systematically analyzing policy documents, reports, and other sector-specific literature 
in a way that would use flexible coding and attention to both rhetorical evidence and empirical evidence so that the sector may that the sector might use to promote itself and position itself in relation to economic development thank you thank you shoshana welcome thank you rachel uh, does anybody want to jump in with a comment or question um, we have about five minutes to discuss um, if somebody feel free to jump in, but I guess my first question is, how did you go about selecting the reports that you did? Rachel, uh, well, uh, what we did is we, we wanted to select reports that were all written right about the same time. Uh, so we chose cities, we tried to have cities that were within several um, you know, areas of the world uh, that were written approximately the same time. And so we, these are the five that we chose. Okay. So was there any sort of um, uh, consideration of who wrote the report, what their background slash expertise was? Because I guess when I'm thinking about comparing across, right, especially if you want to kind of um, just talk about the implication of, uh, you know, the narratives in these reports helping inform policy, you really want to consider how these reports were actually generated in the first place. Yeah, Rachel, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, so we did have the one slide that kind of got into that. And it's something that we talked about and talked about incorporating into the full paper and then um, had the problem that many of us have where we have so much going on that we pulled some things. Um, but we did have people coming again from think tanks. Um, so one academic, um, a municipal group and Really, we did find variation there, but we felt like our sample was too small to make um, broad generalizations about the impact of the, the occupational role or identity of the author on the report. But we do believe it was um, affecting the way, especially that data was utilized. So if we think about the especially uh, quantitative empirical data being pulled into a report versus the kinds of interview quotes um, or other kind of rhetorical evidence, um, you, could, you could see, I think, that it was um, Adelaide and Chicago, which were both academics or academic. And then, I mean, I would consider Landry an academic, right? Shoshana. <laughs> um, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so there was an impact, but we didn't feel um, that our sample was large enough to make broad generalizations about that kind of occupational role and its impact on the reports. Yeah. I mean, I will say that the New York report, which had so many interviews and so many quotes from stakeholders, was written by an outside nonprofit organization and that the Austin report was written by a company. So we did find that, that the report, that the authors of the reports, which we didn't really necessarily think of as the hero, uh, you know, we really searched for, you know, what these reports uh, really contained as far as being the hero, but the authors uh, we think that what we'd have to do is look at a lot more, you know, another paper where we'd really look at uh, maybe all of the reports that we could find, these creative city reports, which of course are very different than cultural plans or other policy documents cities might produce. You might think about um, oh, or, sorry. Go ahead. No, Rachel, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Joanna. Um, I think also this gets at kind of something within the kind of cultural and creative research that a lot of us are doing is that this impact of kind of nonprofit and for-profit spaces really kind of come together in municipal spaces frequently, especially if we're thinking about entrepreneurship, um, whether that be kind of social entrepreneurship that we might be seeing more on the nonprofit side um, or this kind of municipal actors as entrepreneurs that clearly do have economic goals in mind and kind of economic development and city growth as a key piece of it. Um, there's just so much interacting here that unfortunately our five reports can't disambiguate all of that, but um, we're hoping that this tool could be generalized and used more broadly um, to hopefully get at more of that. Yeah, so um, King Peng has a, in the chat box, has a great follow-up question. What are the benefits and challenges using city reports when compared to the academic research papers? Um, for example, a bibliographic analysis. Well, we, I think, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say that these city reports are used in a very different way than an academic paper would be used. I mean, they're really more, uh, you know, 
more like a policy brief with lots of tables and figures. And often they're quite long, 20 or 30 pages at least. So I think that the audience for these kind of Creative City reports is very different than an academic audience. And I think that that you know what we found was that these are used as a tool to make the case for various policy interventions that have to do with the creative economy and they're used to support the the idea that the creative economy is an engine uh, for positive uh, you know entrepreneurial economic growth and development rachel what what would you say about that I think the audience is key there and thinking about the framing of an academic paper and the quite limited audience that we get um, and an audience that's interested in building on ideas versus an audience that's interested in mobilizing resources like a municipal budget or municipal land use. Mm -hmm. um, so the ways that those rhetorical strategies are mobilized toward putting resources, um, whether that be in marketing the city or in um, allocating land or, or other municipal resources or even public private partnerships toward the goal of this kind of generative engine of the creative economy. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, thank you. We'll have more time for discussion later. Um, Jeff, you can go ahead and share your screen and start whenever you're ready. Yeah. All right, well, uh, thank you for coming to my session today, the relationship between state level arts involvement, cognitive outcomes and innovations. I'm Jeff Barbie. I am currently a research specialist in the College of Medicine at The Ohio State University. Uh, when I started this project, I was a, an assessment and evaluation specialist in the IU School of Medicine, as well as a student in the Lilly School. Um, a little bit about my background. The past few years, I have been drifting toward the social sciences, but my doctorate is actually in uh, music performance. And so this was a um, interesting topic to me as a musician. Um, you hear all about the positive impacts that music and the arts has on the cognitive outcomes. Um, this picture here is a picture of my quartet. Uh, the Four Horsemen Tuba Euphonium Quartet. Um, we were performing at the Texas Music Education Association's Professional Development Conference, which is the largest music development, music professional development conference in the country, besides the Midwest Clinic in Chicago every year. Uh, leading up to this clinic, a lot of my friends would post infographics about um, how music makes you smarter. And as much as I wanted to believe that, I was like, mm, there's a lot more to this than just being involved in music. So the two questions we're going to look at today, um, one is, is there a relationship between state level arts involvement and later cognitive outcomes in children and young adults, as well as is there a relationship between state level arts involvement and later innovation outcomes in young adults as well. So, um, A brief, a very brief overview of the literature, um, basically. Um, what you'll find is some studies supporting this and some um, studies saying uh, not so much, but as far as cognitive outcomes, um, being involved in the arts or music uh, leads to a higher IQ, advanced reading and math skills um, in terms of personality, more developed social skills, a sense of belonging, uh, higher scores in conscientiousness and openness. And as far as innovation, a lot of us have read the works by Florida. Um, the arts uh, creates a strong self-employment environment or cultural hotspots. A lurking variable in many studies are economic factors such as socioeconomic status. So the research design that I've come up with is looking at state level arts, state level arts funding and the relationship between personality and we're going to be looking at a data set of big five personality traits. Um, education, we're going to be looking at some of the NAP and SAT data. And for innovation, we're going to look at some patent data. Uh, the covariates we're going to consider in this uh, study is state GDP and unemployment rate, uh, each by state. So the method, um, I looked at the percentage of each state's budget that was allocated towards state funding. I standardized all of my data by year and made an average of this, uh, depending on the sample size we're looking at. Um, I replicated the years from the sample groups I've used from the article, Divided We Stand, which I'll talk about here shortly. 
Um, the three hypotheses that I had going into uh, this study was I expected to see a positive relationship between state level arts funding and personality traits, as well as cognitive outcomes and innovation outcomes. Um, positive, um, not significant, um, because once I looked at the percentage or really lack of percentage of a state's budget allocated toward arts funding, it was, it was kind of sad and concerning. So, where I found my data, I pulled um, legislative um, funding allocated for states um, for um, arts funding from the state's arts uh, funding source book through the state's arts agency. Um, this data contained all 50 states um, budgets for the arts, as well as Washington, D.C. Uh, but for my analyses, I looked only at the 50 states. As far as the total legislative budget for each state, I pulled that from the state expenditure reports uh, found through the National, National Association of State Budget Officers. In this uh, report, you'll find each um, category, the allotment of funding, such as education, healthcare, uh, then, then there's an overall budget legislated. Uh, the covariates that we're going to be uh, using as well um, are found in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, as well as the Bureau of Economic Data. Um, this is the unemployment data by year, as well as state GDP. Personality data comes from an article, Divided We Stand. Um, here's a little bit of information. Uh, Dr. Wintrow was very kind enough to share with me the data set that they used for their article. And in their article, they had five different samples that covered multiple years. Um, they looked at 48 of the states. They did not get a robust enough sample size from Alaska or Hawaii. Um, and out of the five, I replicated the year groupings of samples one, two, and four. Looking at sample one, this ranged uh, from 1999 through 2004, uh, though the personality data collected data into January of 2005. Uh, data two collected data from 2005 to 2009. And sample four, there's a little bit of overlap um, collecting data from 2008 and 2010. Uh, samples three and five were shorter um, uh, spans of years, and they overlap these three sets. So I, I chose to go with these three over the other two. Uh, the education data that I found, uh, this is a bit challenging because um, for K through 12 education, I'm using the National Assessment of Educational Progress data. This is a test not conducted every year. Um, and sometimes it's unreliable depending on the subject. I also pulled the SAT average scores per state by the Digest of Educational Statistics. Uh, once again, uh, there are a few years missing that I've not been able to track down yet. In innovative innovation data, I use the per, um, number of patents per state per 1,000 citizens found at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So the results that I found looking at agreeableness, uh, the first of the five personality traits, uh, we see two of the three samples have a positive relationship. However, um, none are um, remarkable. And once we add our covariates, um, we see similar results. Looking at conscientiousness, the next out of the big five personalities, once again, very, very little effect. And adding in the covariates, the results are quite similar. Conversion uh, results, um, same as the other two, except sample four is almost marginally significant. But when we do consider the covariates, we do find uh, a slight level of significance if you consider 0.1. Uh, when looking at neuroticism, uh, same as the earlier two, the results are non-significant, but positive. And adding covariates, the results still stay positive, but not significant. And finally, openness, uh, two of the three are positive uh, correlations. Uh, the sample four is negative, but none of the results are significant. And if we look at um, the covariates, all of these relationships become slightly negative, but still not significant. Uh, looking at the NAEP results, um, we see a negative correlation. Uh, luckily, it's not significant as well. Um, there's not a data set for sample four because the years this data is collected overlaps with sample two. When we look 
at the, the regression with the covariates, uh, we see similar results. And SAT data, um, once again, we're not seeing a lot of significant findings. Um, two of them are positive. And when we look at the covariates, two still remain positive, but none of them are significant as either. And finally, looking at patent data, this is where I was kind of surprised. All three were negative relationships, but once again, none of them were significant. And this pretty much stays the same when we look at COVID. So the summary of my findings, um, I was expecting all positive relationships. However, the, positive, the relationships were both positive and negative, um, however, not significant. Uh, covariates at this level had very little effect as well. Um, overall, I cannot say that my findings support any of the earlier studies saying that being involved in the arts uh, leads to these um, higher and desirable outcomes. Um, there are several limitations to the study. Um, the sample size is 50. Um, the, the portion of a state budget is so small that it's really hard to measure an impact. Um, when we're looking at ACT scores, this does not only look at college bound students. Some states require students to complete the ACT um, in order to graduate. And the NAEP data is, is um, spotty at times. Um, also looking at the, the budgets, we're really not sure how each state um, handles the allotment for arts funding. Uh, the implications as a musician, um, I think as a musician, I need to be a little more deliberate when I program as to why I'm doing a performance. What am I hoping my audience takes away from there? Um, I could see some stakeholders asking why is it important to fund the arts if we're not really seeing a lot of outcomes at the, the state level. And I think this kind of leads down into the argument that you've seen the literature art for art's sake. I'm not against it, but when it comes to budget cuts as an artist, it's at times perhaps hard to justify why we need funding for the arts. Um, I think for future research, um, future direction for this research would be looking at a panel design, looking at a year to year analysis instead of a grouping of years, um, and maybe looking at what role nonprofits play uh, as far as these outcomes. Um, with that, I will take any questions. Thanks, Jeff. Any questions for Jeff? Um, one from Michael Cummings in the uh, chat box. How much of art spending is being captured by state level budgets? Is there a way to identify school district and nonprofit spending as well? Um, I know the um, Urban Institute has some um, data as far as what the budgets for nonprofits are. Um, at this research, I have not looked at the county level or a smaller a smaller subject, which I think is what really needs to be done to understand the impact that arts funding has. Great. Um, there's, I think there's definitely ways to, so you can definitely get the nonprofit spending by state through the Urban Institute, through the National mm -hmm. Center for Charitable Statistics, um, school district data, um, you definitely can get state level um, state level uh, public education spending for K through 12. Um, and that is, I can't remember exactly where, but that's likely through um, the Department of Education, their statistical program there. Any other questions or comments for Jeff? Uh, can I jump in? Yeah, go ahead, Tal. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. I just want a small, small comment. Uh, first of all, I mean, if your end size is so small, I, I'd be surprised if you find anything significant at all. But more, I think more importantly, I think uh, if you want to really develop this project and to have like more fruitful um, results, you should really be very explicit about how you think that uh, what is the process that links state arts funding to all these uh, uh, outcomes that you uh, have mentioned and try to study, because I think that can really, um, studying this process more explicitly, even in the theoretical level, can really have a lot of uh, um, influence of how you really uh, design the model, which uh, maybe you need to lag 
the uh, amount of funding. You know, don't expect like funding of one year to have right like a immediate impact. And uh, maybe you should look at more or additional uh, um, covariates. Maybe GDP should be measured in per capita and not in uh, uh, like the absolute sum. All uh, all kinds of questions like this, which I think you can really you should really um, uh, give thought of. And, and again, without increasing some of the end, like the panel idea that you mentioned is can be uh, really useful. I think it's really almost a dead end trying to, to, to do such kind of research, but it's really, I mean, the, the thought behind it's really interesting. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything you said, such the, the small sample size really makes this difficult, especially where you don't know where the arts money is being directed. Um, I think a lag is also probably the next thing that I need to do as long, along with the panel study. But then it becomes a question, what's the maximum time for arts education to really make an impact in a student's education? Is it one year? Is it two years? Um, as an artist, I really don't know. I, I tend to do, like to believe that once I play a concert, when they leave the hall, it, it's, it's instant. Of these programs, it's really hard to know, you know, how long does it take for this to really change the mindset of a student? Um, King Fang has some great comments in the chat box too that echo um, Tal's comments. So thank you for those. There are, I, I echo as well um, Tal's comments in that it, the end is, the end size is really small and I would be surprised if you did find anything in the first place. But at the same time, I also question and this is, I think, also um, echoing King Fan's comic comments, but I question sort of why do we want to know this at the state level and why not know this at the individual level or the community level instead? Because that's, if this is really for understanding um, distribution of resources in the arts, I would, actually, I would argue that it's more important to know about how individuals are being impacted as opposed to the state as a whole, since there's so much variation across the state. Um, um, so I, yeah, I would, I would maybe try to take a look at if you can get some individual level or smaller geography data on the same type of data that you have. And I know that there are some that exist in some of the different data sets that you, you presented here. And that might be one option for continuing further on this, this project. And I um, just wanted to also echo Jessica's comment in the chat box. There's some great data on arts course enrollment and student outcomes at the student level that might be really useful for you to use. And that's through the um, IPEDS data, correct, Jessica? I think that's the IPEDS data and um, the NESSE data, which is NSSE, which is um, basically Jessica, back me up here. National Student giving... Survey Exchange Experiments, I think. Yeah, so they have some, um, they have some, they have some, a little bit of data on just arts participation, but the IPEDS data in particular through the Department of Education have, have data on arts course enrollment and student outcomes. So that might be useful for you. Um, any other last, last comment or question? 30 seconds or so. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you, Jeff, so much. So we're gonna go ahead and move to our next presenter, Adrian. So I'm gonna give you, all right. Almost there. There you go. All right, you should be able to share your screen now. Thank you guys, and by the way, so much for having your presentations ready to go and making this so efficient. How are we? Can you see everything and I yep. click everything properly? Looks great. Okay, great. Should I go ahead? Okay. Thank you so much for uh, having us here. It's a privilege. Um, I appreciate that you're still in the room, A, at this, <laughs> this late point uh, in the day. It's been a really, um, a really great experience listening uh, to everybody else's um, research findings and, and production. Uh, Michael is here in the room. Uh, he's gonna jump in when we move to Q&A. Um, uh, we are both reporting to you from uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas um, and the University of Arkansas. Uh, Building Bridges in Arts Entrepreneurship, a systematic review of the art in entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurship in art is still very much a paper um, in development. And um, I'm gonna begin with a slight 
preface, and this will be the only slide that I read to you in, in its in entirety. Um, arts entrepreneurship is still in its early stages as an emerging field of academic inquiry. As such, it is still in the process of defining its own scope and boundaries. In this process, arts entrepreneurship draws heavily from mainstream entrepreneurship. Uh, you say perhaps, but most certainly in part because the business tools associated with entrepreneurship are thought to be positively, uh, are thought to positively impact the financial stability of artists and arts organizations. So this heavy focus on mainstream entrepreneurship, it seems to reflect a, an assumption um, that the arts need entrepreneurship more than entrepreneurship needs the arts. And we find this uh, perspective a, a bit limiting. So to unpack this assumption and perhaps to contribute to the agenda for the arts entrepreneurship field, we descriptively analyze the breadth of approaches to, towards art in entrepreneurship scholarship and towards entrepreneurship in art scholarship. And we ask these three related questions. How does the field of entrepreneurship implicitly conceptualize art? How does the field of art implicitly conceptualize entrepreneurship? And how do or should these conceptualizations inform the integration of art and entrepreneurship in the arts entrepreneurship field? We um, identify and systematically review 73 articles in leading entrepreneurship journals that address the field of the practice of art. We identify and systematically review 87 articles in leading arts journals that address the field or practice of entrepreneurship. And also um, we reviewed 99 articles. I like to say 99 in a bottle of beer. It may be a bit, uh, it may be overkill. Um, uh, articles that explicitly address, explicitly address the intersection of art and entrepreneurship uh, found in arts entrepreneurship and arts management uh, scholarly journals. So uh, really briefly, uh, it's worth noting that three main contexts for arts entrepreneurship inquiry, that is explicit arts entrepreneurship literature uh, inquiry, uh, it focuses primarily on higher education, cultural industries, and the nonprofit sector, with um, the dominant motivations being to increase artists' entrepreneurial skills, to grow the financial well-being of organizations and communities, and of particular interest, and uh, to me, uh, it's both of us in the in the context of this paper to define the field. And sidebar, policy making and creative place making are very strong uh, currents that run through the literature of arts entrepreneurship, um, and institutional critique and art making itself are new and emergent. So, entrepreneurship: how does it conceptualize art? Industry, domain, tool, metaphor, and medium. Industry, domain, and tool, and I'll break, I'll, I'll define those next. Um, they uh, clearly dominate the landscape. Uh, metaphor and medium are these little outliers that I'll touch on really briefly, um, but perhaps need a, a space of their own. Um, and I'll show you, I'll show you what I mean. Industry, uh, uh, in this case, the literature within entrepreneurship is uh, conceptualizing arts as a commercial sector. We've identified domain um, as when arts are, are just simply understood and recognized to be a sphere or activity of knowledge, um, a, a, sorry, a sphere of activity or knowledge, uh, independent of any sort of commercial context. Uh, tool is a much broader category. The arts are considered instrumental um, uh, instruments of sociopolitical change, economic growth, community building, ther therapy, and in one case, an, uh, as an artifact, uh, looking at paintings, for instance, uh, for, uh, of historical study. Again, uh, I'll just say that metaphor and medium are, are little favorites of mine and they're non-central at the moment um, because they're so uh, statistically insignificant. Michael and I have joked often that he seeks the statistical significance and I seek poetry. So perhaps uh, over the mocktails later, metaphor and medium, you could, you could indulge me. Um, but let's look at some really quick examples. I won't read the whole page. 38% of the entrepreneurship articles reference the arts within commercial context. Art is referred to as goods or products. Artists are human capital, they're commercial effectuators, and the cultural industries are mediators between um, the works of art, those who create the works of art and those who buy them, or between uh, the cultural product and service provision. Within domain, that 35% of the uh, literature frames art uh, within 
the space of arts and literature, arts and humanities, arts and sciences, and as you can guess, moves into programs of studies, art schools, um, largely because the discussion is around uh, the arts as discipline. And Tool uh, goes on for two slides. I won't read every one, but you can imagine how uh, art can be con uh, conceptualized as supporting social enterprises, urban interventions, uh, economic growth, a tool for analysis, a source of provocation. I promised I wouldn't read every one. Um, moving into the second page, there are just many, many ways in which um, the arts are seen to be useful uh, uh, towards some end, whether it's a change uh, as, a, as an agent of change, historical record, etc. Um, an interesting quote. Uh, additionally, the study of arts techniques develops agility in unstructured or uncertain situations. Um, and that there's an idea that perhaps the symbolic type of knowledge generated by arts institutions may be useful to um, the emergence of, or instrumental in the emergence of innovative new businesses. Most often metaphor shows up as a pun, but I think it's really interesting that the, arts entrep that the entrepreneurship literature uses the arts to help familiarize a reader with the entrepreneurship content. I won't read it. <laughs> and um, the other outlier that, uh, that fascinates me is this moment in which art itself is used by the researchers, either as a tool for analysis, having entrepreneurs draw, uh, analyzing really bad poetry written by entrepreneurs, or in the case of Gartner, bless Gartner, um, actually writing the entire article in, in poetic verse. Um, terrible poem, good piece of scholarship. So if, if we can switch for a second to how art conceptualizes entrepreneurship, this is very live for us right now. This is the second half of the paper. It's not reflected in the draft that's been posted. Um, so uh, thank you for your indulgence as we move, as we move through this um, pretty fresh, fresh content. Um, art conceptualizes entrepreneurship. There seem to be three uh, categories, uh, meaning making, profit making, and remaking. And I'll explain them. I'll explain them, of course. Uh, meaning making and profit making. Um, this is an even split in terms of the conceptualization of entrepreneurship within the arts literature um, and remaking coming in essentially second to a tie for first place. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what those mean. Uh, as this is all pretty uh, live in its development, I'm also happy to field uh, better terms <laughs> to coin for some of the content that, that we're uncovering. Within meaning making, within this sort of category of meaning making, the, uh, the ends are art. The object is the production, uh, the goal is the production of art. Um, success is framed uh, in, in critical terms, not commercial terms. And the entrepreneur uh, at the, or the group of entrepreneurs in this case are in fact considered and understood to be artists. So within meaning making, there's two, there's a split. And I have a very messy graph I can show at the end that breaks this down. Um, there's content created and there's content sustained. That is, there are, Ventures formed in order to sustain the production of art, which is itself engaged in meaning making. And then 68% of the articles um, found engagement with entrepreneurship and conceptualizations of entrepreneurship embedded in artworks themselves. So there's a huge amount of engagement with entrepreneurship as a concept within artwork, for instance. And I will tell you too that 100% of those engagements, what I've found so far, 100% of them are critiques of neoliberalism. They are critiques of the neoliberal economic framework in which artists and the rest of us are existing and living. Uh, the villain in a play is described as an entrepreneur destroyed by his greed, or um, the staging for an abdo production uh, incorporates um, bricolage as a staging device to create a frenzy for the audience that is experienced presumably by the, the individual caught up in a neoliberal structure. So that's meaning making splits between those two, the production of art, the sustained production of art, and then the creation of artworks themselves. Shifting to profit making, whereas before the ends were, uh, were art, the ends here is business. Success is framed uh, in commercial terms and the entrepreneur is a business person. I hope there's a Continuity here, there's again a double a split in half within, uh, within the category. And um, I am, uh, for lack of a better word at the moment, uh, dividing this into applause and apology within the profit making space, um, uh, within the, the arts conceptualization of, of entrepreneurship. So within profit, uh, profit making, the majority of articles are um, 
engaging in uncritical celebration of commercial success. Um, a theater owner's agility, um, uh, the visionary um, uh, capacity of a, of, a, of a business person within an, with an arts-based service or product. Um, Savoir-faire would be a good way to put it. That's usually um, attached to a single uh, actor who is um, sort of heroic in what they've managed to accomplish. And in the apology space, uh, it's really interesting. This is where commercial success is mitigated by some potential positive outcome. <laughs> so there's a negative uh, 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 connotation to commercialization, but it's understood that if, you know, the commercialization can increase uh, access, um, can be a vehicle for disseminating the arts more broadly, but there's some conflict in there in terms of whether or not that's a good or a bad thing. And lastly, and I'm coming up on the end, remaking. Here, um, the literature looks at um, entrepreneurship largely in intrapreneurial terms. So the ends are, are restructuring within an organization. Success would be organizational in its framework. Um, and uh, the entrepreneur is always a member of that organization. That member may be operating from a central administration, from above a leadership position, or may be somebody who's engaged in institutional critique. But either way, those characters are, those actors are within the institution or within the organization um, uh, acting entrepreneurially to enact either strategy renewal in response to changing conditions on the ground, or, um, and here's another interesting little bit, within the reform space, all of the articles I've come across are written by or on behalf of teaching artists. They engage in um, a critique of neoliberalism specifically within the space of labor and specifically within the higher ed environment. Um, this is my messy chart for later, <laughs> but these are the categories and subcategories um, that I'm still thinking through and therefore, um, I just thought I'd share it for one second. It's my notes to myself. It's a uh, thank you for letting me be vulnerable. <laughs> so I think at this point in our paper development, our question is um, uh, focus a lot on this on the second and the second question and how it may or may inform the the third. How does the field of art implicitly conceptualize entrepreneurship, and how does that um, how can that inform the integration of art and entrepreneurship? I mean, often there's a question, is the arts entrepreneurship more artist or more entrepreneur? What are these definitions that we play with and sometimes play with quite casually? Uh, there's one little, one little thing that keeps sticking in my, in my head, and that is that under that meaning making and remaking those categories, um, where content is created, where the art is made, where the entrepreneurial engagement is within artworks themselves and within the remaking or organizational restructuring ca category, reform is entirely uh, engaged in critique of neoliberalism in the higher ed space. And I think this is a really strange point of, um, of crossover. He was citing uh, Harvey refers to the precarity of life in a neoliberal age. And I wonder if we might consider uh, the teaching artist who engages in institutional critique within the higher ed context to be acting as an artist and that perhaps the activity itself is a form of arts entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. Any questions or comments from the crowd? Um, I will look for hands and chats, but one thing that came up in my last panel that I think is relevant here is, um, first of all, the definition, which you're talking about the definition of arts entrepreneurship and how that's sort of just loosely uh, used depending on context and not a lot of the times not really specifically defined. And so I, I guess I wonder from all of your analysis here, um, the definition that was given for one of the papers in the last panel was entrepreneurial learning is simply, it, it, arts entrepreneurial learning is entrepreneurial learning within an arts context. Um, so I guess I wanted to hear your response to that. And then my second question has to do with, um, again, sort of definitional issues 
Well, let's. I, what, what's your response, I guess, to the first question? Can I can I recap it? Did was the point? If is it just entrepreneurship in an arts context? Yeah, I think the thing for us to unpack um, is why we have such a why we why we assume equivalence between entrepreneurship and business. Right. I think that's something that has to start to you know. If, I'm not the first to say it, but we have to sort of loosen that grip in order to better understand entrepreneurship's full potential in a different context, such as art, in which perhaps profit or business um, related subtopics are irrelevant. Is it still entrepreneurship? Yes. So what are we really talking about? Is there basic entrepreneurship? And when it migrates, um, what I find is that when it migrates into the art space is basic entrepreneurship, uh, it starts to take on the form of socially engaged art, which mm -hmm. is organizing for impact. Um, and that has nothing to do with the formation of a, of a business entity. Well, yeah, the other dichotomy uh, that arose that I would love for you to address as well, based on what you're doing here, is this idea of problem solving versus creating something new. And depending on the context of which you're in, it, the, the two outcomes, the entrepreneurial outcomes are quite different. So yeah. if you think about entrepreneurship within a business setting or even a paper that yeah, our, our paper on civic innovation and, and artists, it was very much focused on this idea of problem solving as the end goal. But within an arts context, you don't really ask your artists to solve the problem, right? You ask your artists in an entrepreneurial training program, let's say, to come up with something new. So mm -hmm. there's these two dichotomies too that are often, I think, loosely um, juggled between well, one of the things that we could we could look to, um, Jason White published last fall, and I think a lot about this space of the institutional critique on the idea of arts entrepreneurship as institutional attack, that there is space within the crossover between the two um, for identifying problems in the first place, and mm. then marshalling to act and address them. Mm. Mm. Did I hear another comment come out? Audio. Um, well, I, uh, th this is Michael. Oh, Michael. Great. Hi. I'm just going to jump in because Adrian's done a, a, a lot of the hard work and just add, you know, as uh, I, I don't know everyone's background here, but I'm perhaps maybe the most traditional entrepreneurship scholar or, or faculty member uh, here in the session. And even within entrepreneurship, we can't really agree on what entrepreneurship is. Yeah. Right? So for, for some people, the debt, you know, I, I teach my doctoral students that there's a, a small tent of entrepreneurship, sort of the, the true believers, and they think they know uh, where the boundaries of entrepreneurship are. And then there's everyone else who's interested in something that they call entrepreneurship. And, and that uh, you know, part, part of the purpose of this paper really isn't to say, this is the one true definition of arts entrepreneurship, but it's to say, here are all the different ways that people conceive of art in an entrepreneurial context, entrepreneurship in an arts context. And then, you know, maybe there is a central core of what arts entrepreneurship is or should be, but also there's a lot of us at the periphery of this that, that care about uh, questions that may not be central, but might be tangential and interesting. Yeah. And that that's part of the conversation too, that, that this survey that we've done that, we, we don't actually, at least Adrian may have, I, I don't have a favorite definition of actually either entrepreneurship or of arts entrepreneurship. Uh, but I recognize them as sort of internally coherent for the conversations that they're trying to contribute to for the questions that they're answering. Yeah, and I would add that you- that, That's part of what we're trying to do yeah. is to say, here, here's the landscape. Here's yeah. what different people are caring about, how they're defining it. And to the extent that, uh, that there is a single conversation that's going to happen in arts entrepreneurship, we're, we're not maybe making a contribution there, right? But it, it's, this is sort of the 30,000 foot view of here, here's the field and here are all the little conversa conversations going on. And, and here are actually two groups that don't know that they're having the same conversation. Mm -hmm. They might be able to talk to each other. And so forming some connections within some of the smaller, uh, smaller research streams within the field, I, I think is, is maybe one of the really interesting, potentially interesting outcomes here. Yeah, agreed. Well, thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you, Michael. Hopefully we can have more discussion later. And um, definitely um, there are some great chats that came in while we were chatting as well. So take a look at those. So uh, Tal, I'm gonna give you the floor. One second. 
floor. All right, I'm going to take away the floor from a couple people. I might have taken away the floor from too many people, but hopefully that's okay. Um, oh, Casey, sorry. All right. So um, I actually will start with this presentation and I will be right on time. So I'm timing myself. So I'm uh, just going to start with the first couple of slides and then Tal Fader, my co author, is going to take over. And this is really his genius. So um, very preliminary work from a paper we're working on titled Motivations for Self-Employed Artistic Work. And we're using data from the contingent worker surveys in the um, CPS, the current population survey, which is a large US Census Bureau survey. So Tal, you can advance, thank you. So um, brief introduction and just framing for this paper. Um, if you've read any of the statistics, we know that artist occupations, as they're measured through the US Census at least, have very high rates of self-employment. So about one third, depending on what source you look at, of artist workers are self-employed. And so these are primarily artists who identify artistic occupations as their primary occupation. But if you go into the entrepreneurship literature, we're talking about entrepreneurship here, and self-employment is what we're using as a measure, and self-employment is not always entrepreneurship, and in fact, it's not the same thing at all. But there's a lot of literature in the entrepreneurship literature that talks about how the former often leads to the latter, and so that might be in sort of developing entrepreneurial skill sets, um, being exposed to entrepreneurial settings as a self-employed worker, et cetera, et cetera. So there is some link here, and self-employment is, is naturally used as a proxy for entrepreneurship for this reason. Entrepreneurship, and I don't need to go into the literature here, but is linked to various economic benefits from earlier times, obviously, um, uh, in the entrepreneurial literature. But then there is also this idea that artists and creative workers have these economic benefits as well. And so I'm sure you've been familiar with a lot of these studies that are listed here, but this is this idea that creative workers can actually have some sort of effect on the um, local economic or regional economic conditions of a geographic area. So in general, if you read any of the sociology literature, the old um, labor economics literature on artists, artists tend to be, artist workers tend to be personified as what we call footloose and independent. And so these are two characteristics that go along with artist workers. This idea of being footloose is that they're uh, really flexible workers. Uh, they, they make their, they uh, have their own schedules. They decide what they're going to do. So these really autonomous types of workers. They're also ca characterized as independents. And so this is very much related to the fact that again, they're very autonomous and this is often why the personification of artists is often conflated with the word entrepreneur, because in the entrepreneurial literature, we often see the characterization of these types of workers as footloose, independent, autonomous, et cetera. But I would argue that there really is a um, an overlap, a messy overlap here between artist and entrepreneur and so much of the literature we read on artist entrepreneurs that's not very well explained. So there are important distinctions between artists and entrepreneurs and that when recognized, we believe can help tease out the unique factors that influence occupational choices. So once you start to make these two words distinct and these two types of work statuses distinct, you can also start to identify the factors that influence workers to choose whether or not they want to be, let's say self-employed versus wage employed, artists versus non-artists, which starts to be very important when you're trying to understand occupational decision-making. So our research questions for this study are what are the motivations for self-employment of artists? And then what are the differences in self-employment motivations between artists and non-artists? And so I'll just give it over to Tal at this point. Thank you, Joanna. Okay, so to answer these questions, a data set, which is a contingent worker supplement from the current population survey. The current population survey is one of the biggest representative surveys uh, which are related to labor statistics uh, that are available in the US. And specifically the continued worker supplement within it contains really uh, interesting questions about, re uh, responsible asked about the reasons for self-employment. 
So actually this uh, supplement was uh, only conducted six times in the last 25 years, but fortunately uh, it was conducted with almost identical questions. So we can really compare between years and what we actually do is to um, pull the years together to uh, one uh, big data set. Uh, what we do is to, like uh, Jonas said, we compare between artists and non-artists, and for that we use the uh, NEA definition of uh, uh, artistic occupations. So this is like the big data set that we had from the uh, current population survey and the uh, continued worker supplement. So actually you see that like uh, uh, Jonah has described, around a third of the art artists in the sample are uh, self-employed, whereas only 11% of the non-artists are self-employed. And what we do in this research, we actually only focus on the subsample of self-employed workers, both artists and artists. Looks like Tal has frozen for one moment. So let me just jump in so we don't lose any time. And then he'll, there you go, Tal. Yes, yeah. yeah, sorry. Okay, tell me if it happens again. Thank you. Uh, so um, the respondents gave 17 different uh, answers to the question, why did they go self-employed? Which we reclassified and merged and we came up with seven uh, broad categories of reasons for employment, which are like you see, um, uh, people having independence, uh, wanting flexible time, economic reasons, personal and family reasons, lack of choice, training and other reasons. Really, the of the artistic profession itself and not uh, the effect of other uh, social demographic and we also for uh, uh, also both the social demographic and work related um, factors which are known from the previous literature to be to decisions for of self employment in general what is in particular without getting uh, into too much technical details i just say that we use logistic regression to estimate the propensity of being an art dependent on the different uh, uh, self employment reasons given and we, of course, control also for this uh, set of social demographic and uh, work related uh, factors and uh, also control for the year of the survey. Okay, so let's go to the to some of the findings. So here we see the uh, frequency of the uh, different uh, um, motivation for self employment over the whole sample. However, when we break the sample and separate between artists and non artists, we see we have really a clear differences between the two. Artists, which are shown here in the orange bars, are less likely than non artists in the blue bars to go freelance for favoring independence or for expecting economic benefits out of uh, uh, being self employed. At the same time, artists are more likely. Uh, to be self-employed for uh, fencing time flexibility, for personal and family uh, reasons, or for a lack of choice. Uh, these small graphs here uh, confirm that the differences between artists and non-artists occupations in the uh, motivation for self-employment are pretty consistent across the very uh, long say, time span that we are looking at, uh, although the size of the gap may vary a bit uh, between year to year. Okay, so uh, let's go now to the result of the regression models. So first of all, model one on the left-hand side shows us that the most of the differences that, we, uh, uh, that we've seen, that we found in the uh, bar graphs are actually statistically significant. Um, so going to the second and the third model, when we add uh, also controls for the individual factors in model two, and on top of that, when you add controls in model three, also for the uh, year effects, uh, we see that the coefficient of the flexible time reason and the personal reason becomes smaller and actually insignificant. This means actually that the discrepancies that uh, we find between artists and non-artists uh, uh, regarding, I mean, in relation to these uh, two reasons actually stem not from the being artists and non-artists, not for a profession, but from the social demographic characteristics, uh, the different social demo demographic characteristics of uh, artists and non-artists. And to show you these differences, I will scroll down to the bottom of the table to the control variables part. And we see that basically artists tend to be more female, uh, less married, uh, more college degree holders and more white 
which is accountable to uh, accounts to the fact that there is a difference in uh, the uh, preference of um, uh, flexible time and other uh, personal reasons. Ah, uh, sorry again. And uh, model four, interestingly, uh, in model four, uh, if we concentrate only on the core artistic um, occupations, uh, we're excluding uh, architects and uh, designers, we see that the uh, coefficient not only persists, but even gets more accentuated. So this is even more uh, uh, the case for this uh, more classic uh, type of uh, artists. Okay, to sum up the findings in a few words, so we saw that artists are less likely to go freelance for economic reasons. They are more likely to do that for independence, flexible time and personal reasons. Although favoring independence and time flexibility is actually not associated with artistic professions more than it is associated with other professions. Artists are also more likely to go freelance for lack of choice than non-artists are and are also uh, more at risk of being driven to self-employment due to uh, personal and family reasons. So what, we, what can we gather from this? How can you like integrate these findings to a uh, more wider uh, understanding? So first of all, we can see that many, I mean, we know that many workers like Zyana said in the beginning, uh, choose to go self-employed because they expect uh, that this status will carry uh, some financial prospect, a better financial prospect for them. However, what we see here, that for artists, professionals, it is less likely the case that uh, they will find uh, self-employment economically rewarding. Going freelance is uh, uh, less likely to be a rational economic choice, and independent artists, entrepreneurs, are less probably of the uh, commercial entrepreneur type, and maybe uh, of other, maybe more social types. Second, uh, we see that the most uh, frequent reasons for self-employment among artists, uh, if we look at the, um, like the absolute uh, frequency, are uh, the uh, favoring uh, independence and the need for flexible time. However, in these reasons, they are no different from non-artists. Other workers also go self-employed because they want just as well independence being their own bosses. They want just as well to have flexible time. So maybe this uh, image that Joanna described of the free-spirited, footloose, uh, non-committing, independent, flexible artist is, my, is maybe a bit uh, unjustified. Uh, lastly, uh, we see that getting pushed toward freelance work for a uh, lack of choice is actually the reason that most clearly characterizes the artistic profession uh, contrary to other occupations, even though there's still a, uh, this is still a relatively small uh, amount of artists that really state this as their first and foremost reason to go self-employed. And this is probably related to all the structural constraints of the cultural sector with, it all, with all its inherent problems we all know, such as the excess, of a supply, excess supply of artistic labor, which I think is a point which we've seen in other um, We've seen it in other uh, panels here today also, this uh, difficulty of people to get really, um, uh, to be employed, to get employment in the art sector, which is not self-employed, it's really difficult. So just to sum up uh, and conclude uh, our paper, we studied here uh, uh, the, the motivation for self-employment as reported directly by a self-employed artist over a period of around uh, 22 years. We've seen that the individualistic image of the freelance artist as this ent autonomous entrepreneur is only partially accurate, accurate because the pull factors of independence and time flexibility are not unique to artistic profession itself, but are more related to social demographic characteristics uh, of the uh, people who go, uh, who, are, who tend to be artists. We also seen that self-employment of artists is less likely to stem from economic uh, reasons and more than having self-employment as a professional goal, artists probably are pushed towards self-employment due to the structure of the sector. And just 
saying finally that I think we think that these findings really can have important implications for understanding the future effects of these pandemics which we all experience now on the patterns of artistic employment and the possible solutions and the way to support independent artists in this difficult time, but also uh, in general. Thank you, that we all. Thank you, Tal, stayed right on time. Questions or comments? Or you can, um, yeah, questions or comments on that. Um, we can also, we have about 15 minutes to open up the discussion to, for other papers as well. I see Rachel has her hand. Oh, Rachel, I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I'm really interested in, so often in the sociological literature, we think about, um, you know, the increasing precarity that's happened since the kind of 1980s. And I'm so interested to see that there wasn't too much of a change. Like these factors have always, always since 1995, at least been an issue. Um, so I'd love to hear maybe your thoughts about interpreting that and maybe the fact that there's not a huge shift after 2000 or so, let's say. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's cyclical. And we have this paper, Doug and I, Doug Noon and I in Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice that shows, um, takes the CPS data and looks at self-employment trends among artists before, during, and after the recession. And what you find is that self-employment, and this is not for all occupations, this is for artist occupations, and it's really unique to artist occupations, but self-employment for artists really spikes um, during and after recessions. And, but then we see basically declines back to, to normal values after the recession. And I, like Tal mentioned in our concluding slide, I think we're probably going to see the same thing here where you're going to see, right, this big spike after the pandemic or during the pandemic. And then we're gonna probably go back down to regular levels. So it's almost like a finance, it's almost like a safe haven, the self-employment status for the artist worker. Yeah, I would just want also, oh, sorry, did I cut you? No, I was asking okay. you to add. Just, just to add, thanks Rachel, it's really a great question. It's also something that we thought it's really uh, interesting to see this persistence, but just to, just to be clear with the um, dates of the survey, if you don't remember the years, we have the last uh, um, more, most current uh, wave in 2017 and the one before that, it's two, uh, 2005. Mm -hmm. So actually all the 2008 uh, recession I mean, we have something before the recession, something uh, much after the recession. So I guess I uh, think would have looked a bit different uh, if we had data from like 2010 or something like that. Right. And that's true. I agree with that. Um, the CPS data are done on obviously a monthly basis. So we were able to look at uh, self-employed artists in the, from the CPS data. But the thing is the CPS basic data don't have the motivation variables. They only have the observation, so they only have observable characteristics, so um, age, et cetera, it's, uh, age, sex, et cetera. So that's, um, that was the, the topic of the former paper, and now we're trying to look into these motivations um, a little bit more. Tally, you have your hand up. Hi, thank you. Hi, Hi nice to see you. So uh, thank you for a very interesting paper. Um, I think that uh, it's important to emphasize that uh, independence and flexibility are two very misleading uh, characteristics, as you indeed pointed out, that uh, cover uh, sometimes a harsh reality for these artists. And I was wondering whether uh, a large part of the story here is about gender in um, more ways than you can uh, show by just controlling for gender, maybe looking at interactions or something like that, because we know from previous research that um, these circumstances have a lot to do with gender. And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask uh, if you can uh, say a few words about what the alternatives are to being self-employed mm -hmm. in the context of this specific market. So the gender question is a good one because the last paper that was on this topic, um, one of the big findings from there was that married women were much more likely to enter into self employ transition into self-employment as opposed to married men. And we tested that. Um, we could test that again. I, we have both gender and marital. Do we, I think we're missing marital status. Is that right? Tal? No, we have, we have marital status. 
Okay, so we could test that again to see whether or not there's that sort of same trend in here. Um, Tal, did you want to say something about the gender point? Yeah, it's it's super super a, a good point, and I think really should uh, incorporate it more in later versions of the paper. Uh, but actually, we have some some uh, uh, findings. We we didn't include them here because. With another specification of the model, we use multinomial logistic models, and there we really saw that um, uh, economic reasons are less beneficial for women artists, uh, like Italy you say, and that lack of choice is more probable for, for women artists. And I really think that uh, really gender plays a, a big role. Uh, also, knowing that uh, in our sample, most like the majority of artists are really are female. And about the uh, alternatives. Yeah. So first of all, uh, there's all kinds. I mean, most of the people in our sample are not self-employed. So either they are employed in all kinds of um, uh, uh, organization, which may be art organization or, or non-art organization, where they serve and work in the artistic professions. And then we have uh, here uh, designers and, and painters, all a kind of. Uh, art services and also another uh, important category is people who um, are another entrepreneurship avenue is uh, uh, forming your own uh, uh, like uh, maybe a NGO or a non-profit organization and then you are not really uh, regarded as self-employed am I right Joanna? Right well and the other um, so in the contingent worker survey too there's actually various and Tal you really looked into that there are various different categorizations of even contingent work because we're using the very specific definition of being self-employed and so that, and that's self-reported but there's also um, contractual workers uh, temp workers, there's lots of different ways to measure contingent employment. And it was honest, and then there's obviously wage employment. So working for an employer full, full time or part time, but for a wage. And it was honestly a matter, I think it was just sample size that we had to really reduce, right, the categorization to self employed to look at that particular issue. But yeah, thank you. Does anyone have questions or comments um, just that they want to make for the, like the synthesis of the panel, the three papers that we just heard? Monica. I just put that in the uh, comment section that, you know, maybe these, this information feeds back into the quest for um, defining arts entrepreneurship. And it seems like one really uh, distinguishing factor is that arts entrepreneurship is often existential need <laughs> for survival versus business entrepreneurship is this quest of, of, of creating a, a something greater, but there's much more survival essence and career development in there. So just as a thought maybe in, into this whole definition development. You can actually take a look at, I mean, this is why it's so important, in my opinion, to study occupations. Um, when you're looking at, for example, self-employed, self-employment studies, a lot of the times those studies just lump self-employed together. But if you actually separate out occupations, the trends you see among different occupations in self-employment are like drastically different. And so it's not even just arts versus business. It's, you know, agriculture, you know, farmers and artists and and those trends, depending on, again, like business cycles vary a lot based on what occupation and industry you select into. So it's just a matter of, I think, having to be really, really specific. Any other questions or comments people want to bring up? Yeah, I've got I've got one more uh, in, in relation to, to this paper, Tal and, and Joanna. Uh, one of the things I wonder is so you, you've talked some about this necessity piece, right? Sort of this lack of this lack of choice. I wonder though if uh, creative industries aren't a little bit unique on the other side as well, where someone uh, in a traditional wage employment situation who loses a job may not have a skill right? That can be revenue generating. And so they would fall into the, they might be more likely to fall into the unemployed category 
than the self-employed category. Um, and I just think about uh, the career trajectory of people I've, you know, my, my own father or some of my other relatives or friends who have have gone in and out of wage employment, yeah. have not really been self-employed in between because they didn't have something to fall back on. And so that 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 puts a little bit of a different spin on it uh, because, uh, you know, it's self-employment by necessity, but also it's revenue generation a, as an opportunity. Yep. Uh, where if you're a, if you're a freelance artist or a musician or something else, you, you have a, a revenue source to fall back on, whereas uh, other wage earners may not. It's a great point. And um, in this last paper we did, when we looked at self-employment trends, we also looked alongside at unemployment trends during the same period for artist workers. And um, it, I mean, in general, over the recessionary period, we saw uh, the artistic labor f force, I believe, increase, right? Which is like it, those who actually you know, are employed, self-employed or wage employed, the number of people actually increased over <laughs> across the recessionary period, but you just saw the work status actually changing from wage to self-employed. And I would totally predict that you would not see that in in other occupations or industries. Yeah, good, great point. Yeah. I think all this issue of intermittent uh, work that really characterizes uh, some of uh, uh, the artists and some of the occupation within the artistic uh, workforce is, is really uh, important. Yeah, Shoshana. Yeah, I had a question. You know, uh, Tal, you were talking about the data from the recession and Johanna, I know you said that too that the self-employment went up, and I guess, you know, an artist right around the recession, the last recession. And I think a lot of times, or I think the data might show that going back to school increased, you know, um, student, young people decided to go and get a master's degree or go to, you know, go to school. I wonder if that predicts anything about what's going to happen with this pandemic, whether yeah. people will become more self-employed and whether, you know, I mean, I know some of the students that are graduating that have graduated undergraduate degrees. I said, well, maybe you should go back and get your master's now. You know, I wonder if that's going to trend as well. Shoshana, there are some great papers I can send you that look at the recessionary impacts on higher education enrollment. And I've sent these papers to a lot of my very worried colleagues here um, because the data are, it's very clear that student enrollment uh, increases during, during recessionary periods. The only, the caveat there is that it's generally part-time enrollment and that student debt levels also increase at the same time. Uh, yeah, but I can send you, there's a couple of great NBER papers on that, on that question. That's really interesting. And Ohio State is reporting its highest yeah. level of enrollment for fall. Yeah. We had the same thing here summer and we haven't reported fall, but I, I anticipate it being similar. Thank you. Um, last comment or question before we wrap up. Um, okay. Thank you all for a wonderful panel uh, and staying all day. That is a really, um, I mean, it was a challenge, I'm sure, to stay on Zoom all day. So thank you so much. We are not finished, though. Um, we are going to stay in this room, and Doug and everyone else is going to come over. They're going to come over and join us, and we're just going to have a, a few wrap-up uh, comments. Um, and then there's a, there's a happy hour after this, too, if anybody wants to stick around for that. But uh, just you know, take a break and stay here if you can for some final comments from Doug. Thank you again, you did a great job.